um, in this webinar, I'm going to be talking about the objectives of you nutrition um, to achieve optimum performance, um, the importance of rumen health and how to keep the rumen balanced, the advantages of maximizing the contribution from forage, and the main reason for that would be to optimize uh, forage quality and minimize the amount of concentrates and supplements purchased on farm to reduce costs of production. Um, I'll be talking about interpreting and using forage analyses in diets and how vital that is. Um, no point me being asked to put a ration together if I haven't got some forage analysis to base it on, otherwise it's pure guesswork. Um, and forages do vary enormous, enormously from one year to the next. And then at the end of the webinar, I will um, go through a simple way of calculating um, a diet based on your own forage analysis. So in the terms of what Leslie and I have done in terms of the Feeding the You book, we have really taken a production cycle approach. So we haven't um, just looked at late pregnancy. We've actually tried to look at the whole production cycle. So starting from weaning to mating and considering how very important it is to get used in the right condition, um, flushing if necessary, but getting in the ideal condition to optimize ovulation rate. We then looked at the period from mating to scanning and trying to make sure the ewe is in optimum condition again with no great disturbances to nutrition, keeping her on a fairly maintenance level of nutrition right through to scanning so that we're not getting some big shifts in um, nutrient intake and potential loss of embryos. We then look from scanning to lambing when we're looking at this time of the year, largely when we're looking to increase energy intakes to meet the increasing energy and protein requirements of the growing lamb and um, other development and getting ewes primed for a good lactation. And then we're looking at lambing to weaning. So we're optimizing um, uh, milk production um, and grazing and grazing utilization to get the best lamb performance we can. And then, of course, the whole cycle starts again. But what's really, really important is that there are great interactions between all of these stages of the production cycle. And each, if, if we get it wrong in one phase, we're likely to have an impact and knock-on effect on other uh, parts of the year. So really important. And Leslie will focus on in her webinar on uh, body condition scoring and the huge value it has to managing use correctly and to optimum uh, levels. So just to put it all in perspective, um, we very much have looked at feed costs. So I just want to walk you through this. In terms of the cheapest feed available to sheep, um, grazed grass is our cheapest at something like six pence a kilogram of dry matter. And when you look at that in terms of pence per unit of energy, we talk about metabolizable energy, it's about half a penny a megajoule. So the cheapest we can get really of any foodstuff available. If we start making that grass into silage, we can actually double the cost of that energy. So we end up with over a penny a megajoule for um, good grass silage. And if we make poor grass silage, that can actually be often more expensive than good grass silage. So think about that in terms of um, how we use silage, how we keep it, how we store it, how we utilize it and, and optimize intake of, of use with li limited wastage. If you look at a comparison um, with whole barley, for instance, um, whole barley is something like 125 pounds a ton at the moment um, off the farm. Um, but if you look at it in terms of pence per kilogram of dry matter, it's about 14, just over 14 pence, um, which actually makes it in energy terms less expensive than grass silage, uh, just over a penny a megajoule. It's hard to take that sometimes or understand and appreciate that, but sometimes concentrates can be more um, cost effective than, than grass silage if the silage has been costly to make. And then, of course, we move on to the most expensive ingredient coming onto most sheep farms, and that would be the compound feed. And here I've taken an example of about £240 a tonne of fresh uh, compound, costing in the order of 28 pence per kilogram of dry matter, or 2.23 pence per megajoule of energy. So you can see what we need to do is, is maximise the use of grass and, and, and well-made forage and, and lower cost forage um, and minimise the amount of concentrates. So um, that is, is really what we're aiming for, to get 
cost-effective production. So what we're trying to do is feed the rumen for optimum fermentation, get the best out of that by digesting forages as well as we possibly can. And in terms of um, cost, um, the costs are just shown in a sort of small graph there for you on the right-hand side of the screen, just to show the sort of scale we have in terms of cost per megajoule of energy. Obviously, those figures don't take any account of the protein content of different feeds, just simply the energy content. So digestion in ruminants is really um, uh, fundamental. We've got to really get that rumen functioning very well um, to maintain the health and productivity at the U at all stages of the production cycle. But it is particularly critical in these last few weeks before lambing um, when we start putting concentrates into the diet and the effect concentrates can have on upsetting rumen function because of lowering rumen pH and, and disturbing fiber digestion. So the rumen is the most important digestive organ in any ruminant um, and it needs a constant and balanced nutrient supply to make the best of the diet on offer. And that means supplying fibre from our forages, but it may also mean adding fermentable energy, be it sugar, starch, uh, digestible fibre, and if necessary, um, some concentrates. But it also might mean adding some rumen degradable protein to get those bacteria in the rumen um, munching through that um, forage as well as it possibly can. So we need a balance of fermentable energy and rumen degradable protein. And just to walk you through that in a sort of schematic diagram, if you imagine this green blob in the middle of, middle of your screen is a rumen. The rumen like working at sort of around pH 6 to 6.5, um, which is, as I often say, the same as grass likes growing out in a soil, 6 to 6.5 pH. Um, and if we upset that rumen, we don't get the efficient digestion we're aiming for. Um, so if we put in a forage, um, that forage could be perfect and probably the, the nearest perfect forage we can feed into a, into a rumen would be grazed grass. Um, but many of us are making um, conserved forage for late pregnancy feeding um, and um, we need to make sure that the analysis, uh, we've got the analysis of that forage and it may be deficient in um, in um, Sorry, how, how, can everybody still hear me? Hello? I should be able to hear Yes, hey, you. Hello? you still sound fine. And you can still see my screen. I just got to just, yeah. Yeah, it's just slightly delayed sometimes, but yeah, we can hear you fine. Oh, good. Sorry. I just got a, a sign on the screen saying something had happened. Um, right. So the nearest perfect forage we could offer to a sheep would be um, grazed grass um, uh, because it usually has lots of digestible energy, uh, fermentable energy, and it usually has lots of rumen degradable protein. But some of the com com conserved forages we actually um, feed to our ewes in late pregnancy can be a bit deficient in either of those two ingredients. So we may have a forage that is low metabolizable energy and low fermentable energy, and it may have a low level of um, rumen degradable protein. So what we might need to add, we might need to add some rumen degradable protein, which would be something like a rapeseed meal or a high um, protein uh, molasses mix or any other sort of protein supply that would be available to the bugs. The simplest form of rumen degradable protein is urea, but it's not often used in compound feeds, but it can be included in feed blocks. So the other ingredient we might need to add into the recipe to get a good fermentation might be some extra fermentable energy. And those are the things like digestible fiber in something like beet pulp, um, digestible sugar and starch, starch coming mainly from cereals, the sugar coming from things like molasses or um, sugar beet pulp um, and other sugar rich um, ingredients. So if we can actually supply the bacteria with the protein and the energy they require, we can get that fermentation really rolling and really making the best of the forage we put into the diet. If you don't supply, if you actually get a limited amount of rumen degradable protein, you will get limited forage digestion and inefficient pr production of volatile fatty acids and inefficient digestion altogether. So it really is key to get that balance um, right. The other 
essential ingredient is water. Um, hopefully nobody would have forgotten that one. Um, the rumen um, also needs a daily supply of cobalt um, and some other major minerals. Um, phosphorus, um, certainly in early uh, lactation, we need a daily supply of magnesium to be put into the rumen too um, to avoid um, grass staggers. But the rumen bacteria take cobalt, for instance, and manu manufacture vitamin B12, which is really essential in glucose metabolism in the body. So there are other ingredients we need to keep that rumen functioning to its optimum. The other thing that's key to a stable rumen, keeping that fermentation um, correct and keeping the pH right, is saliva. So saliva is really effective at buffering acid in the rumen. And the acid is sometimes created by throwing in large feeds of starchy or very sugary concentrates. So um, if we had um, a ground wheat or a rolled wheat and we put rather too much of it into the diet, maybe more than half a kilogram at once, that could have a very negative impact on rumen pH. So the saliva is working away to try and help buffer the changes in pH within the rumen when we add um, sort of acid, um, acid producing um, feeds like cereals and sugars. The, um, effectively, what happens if we've got the rumen fermentation correct, um, the microbial um, population within the rumen is multiplying up, reproducing itself, and ultimately some of these bacteria die off and they actually move on down the digestive tract into the abomasum and onto the duodenum, and we get the microbial protein produced, which is basically the mainstay of protein nutrition for the ruminant. Um, the other element of protein that actually gets through the rumen is what we call digestible undegradable protein, and that is um, coming from ingredients like soya bean meal or soy pass, soprolin, those sorts of ingredients which actually aren't degraded by the rumen bacteria but just pass on straight through the gut like, uh, and are digested like we would. The other thing that's happening, we're getting the volatile fatty acids being produced, acetate, propionate, butyrate within the rumen, and these are absorbed through the rumen wall and are uh, taken to the liver to be metabolized and are the major source of energy for the ruminant. There is one element of the diet that doesn't get used in the rumen. That's a non-fermentable energy, which is the fats and oils. And they um, generally, well, they can't be fermented and they are used further on down the digestive tract. So really important we keep this rumen happy and we don't um, throw in too many feeds that are going to disturb that pH because basically what happens, we upset forage digestion. So just to show you on a typical, um, pretty normal conventional way of feeding sheep. Um, if you look along the bottom, that sort of hours of the day, on the left-hand side of the screen is the pH or the acidity of the rumen. And if you look, there's a little um, line saying TMR, that's total mixed ration. And a TMR is a perfect way of feeding ewes in late pregnancy <coughs> um, because animals are allowed the same diet 24 hours a day with no shift in composition. So they have the same uh, diet so there's basically they're getting exactly the same so there's no shifts in room and pH but in a more conventional <coughs> um, uh, sheep system we would be um, feeding maybe two feeds of concentrates in a day so we have a room and pH of say seven um, with mar largely fiber in the diet then we feed some concentrates and that usually has the impact effect of lowering the rumen pH and potentially if it's a very large feed of concentrates it can knock the pH so we actually get very little cellulose or fiber digestion in the rumen. The ewe takes a little bit of time to recover her pH from that and you can see as, as we, we shoot down in pH and then it rises up again the ewe's on a steady state again and then what we do later in the day is feed her again with another feed of concentrates. Now, the effect on rumen pH varies enormously depending on what concentrate you feed. The more starch, the more sugar in that concentrate, the more impact it will have on uh, cellulose digestion. So safer, safer feeds, oats, um, uh, sugar beet pulp, they have less impact on rumen pH because of their lower levels. Um, or well, sugar beet pulp having digestible fiber and um, oats having quite a fibrous seed coat and not as high a level of starch as uh, wheat and barley, for instance. So moving on to uh, forage analysis, um, obviously we're looking at taking grazed, um, um, 
conserved grass, getting um, good high quality grass, conserving it in, in a clamp or a big bale. And I put that picture of um, a pile of well-maintained big bales in there just to emphasize how important it is, given the cost of making this silage, to keep them um, well protected from birds and vermin um, and um, you know to patch up any holes. Um, I regularly see farm, see piles of uh, bales where they've been pretty neglected, birds have pecked holes in them and um, the resulting silage inside has been deteriorating over weeks um, and it's become pretty unpalatable, mouldy and, and basically going off and not suitable for feeding sheep in late pregnancy. So um, my ideal analysis for sheep or my target or benchmark uh, is given in this slide. So we've got a dry matter of greater than 25%. Sheep don't like wet silage. It takes far too long for them to eat enough to meet their energy requirements. So if you can aim at greater than 25%, and many, many big bales are obviously much higher than that, anywhere up to 60 70% dry matter for um, big bale silage. Clamps tend to be wetter, but if we can be above 25, that's all to the good. We're looking for digestibility of over 65, if possible for late pregnancy. Poorer quality silage is okay if you're having to feed conserved forage further out um, in mid-pregnancy, but um, 65 devalue or above is what I would be looking for for um, late pregnancy feeding to minimize the amount of concentrates we need to offer. So the D value is directly related to the metabolizable energy, the ME figure, and if we can be aimed at 10.5 or better, that's um, obviously beneficial too. So crude protein, we're looking for a 12% or more, um, a pH of more than four. If we get incredibly acid silage, and that does limit the palatability of um, the forage to the ewes and we end up getting uh, reduced intake. Likewise with ammonia, we don't want too much protein breakdown in a silage. That's usually indicative of a very poor fermentation, of poor process going on, maybe with some ash or soil getting into the silage and causing clostridial bacteria to break down the protein and releasing ammonia as a result. And that often is tied in with high butyric acid and potential problems with listeriosis. <clears throat> so I've actually given you an example of a silage um, uh, analysis just in front of you. Um, it's very, very detailed and the majority of farmers would not be able to use all this information in terms of ration formulation. But I just wanted to point out some of the key things um, that I would use. So in terms of um, the energy um, key indicators of energy. This is a very high quality silage, not typical of ones I see for sheep generally. Um, 76 D value, extremely um, high energy, 12.1 ME, 8.7 fermentable energy. As I mentioned before, fermentable energy is what we need to feed the bacteria in the rumen. So that's a key parameter that I need to be able to formulate a diet. So the ME and the fermentable energy are key um, uh, indicators of quality for me. Um, the one at the bottom, the ash, is a key one too. If I see figures of more than about 9% um, there, I'm starting to suspect there's some soil contamination and potential for a risk for listeriosis. In terms of um, the important things for crude protein, crude protein only tells us how much nitrogen there is basically in a silage. So that's not altogether useful. We want to know how much rumen degradable protein there is available for the um, bacteria. And that is a key piece of information I need to uh, work out the balance of protein you need, the concentrates you need to supplement silage. And again, the DUP is that fraction of the grass silage protein which is going through the rumen undigested and you will notice that the highest proportion of protein from silage would be um, ERDP, rumen degradable protein, not DUP. So I just want to talk about the factors of for affecting forage dry matter intake because we have to work out the amount animals um, eat on dry matter given the huge variation in dry matter that we see in forages. So dry matter itself has an impact on intake. As I said, very wet silages tend to have lower intake. So we're looking for that higher dry matter. Um, pH, we've mentioned, and ammonia. The digestibility has a big impact on um, intake. The higher the digestibility, 
the more the animal will eat. So the higher the ME, the higher the D value, the more the animal will eat, simply because that is more digestible and gets through the gut quicker. So the animal is looking to refill because she's digested the, the first mouthful she's eaten so she can eat more. The other thing that will affect um, intake is chop length. So we will always get a higher dry matter intake of silage on a precision chopped um, clamp silage or a, bale, a chopped bale than we would on anything that's a full length long fiber. So um, you will always see slightly lower intakes on big bale silages than you would on clamp silages. The other important element as well of, of affecting dry matter intake would be the presentation of the feed to animals. This is a picture of the, um, it's an old picture of Adas Rosemond from years ago, um, but it was a nice efficient way driving down the middle of a feed passage and, and delivering um, concentrates and silage um, in a TMR um, to animals um, very easily and quickly um, but it does depend on all animals being able to get their fair share of um, the mix or the silage and we have a minimum requirement of 10 to 15 centimeters per head of trough space to really achieve ad lib intake of forage so that is a key to um, making sure we're optimizing forage intake the other one that can affect intakes is competition so I'm always in favor of keeping um, that yearlings and ewe lambs in separate groups away from the older ewes so that there's not too much competition and keeping the shy feeders away from the troughs. So um, when you get a silage analysis back, I always think it's a good idea just to do a bit of a hand assessment of the forage, just to make sure you agree with what um, the analysis says. So you can check dry matter by squeezing. Obviously, if you squeeze a lot of water out of a sample, then it's very likely to be well below 25% dry matter. Um, if you get no water out, it's above 25, and obviously it's harder and harder the drier our forage gets to um, assess the dry matter because it's actually just doesn't even hold into a ball and you can't um, get any um, moisture out of it at all. Um, the digestibility, you can tell that generally by assessing the sharpness of the fibre. It's very easy in a clamp silage to feel how fibrous it is, not quite as easy in a big bale, but feel for the sharpness and toughness of the fibre. And if you're concerned about pH, you can do it with a pH meter or use using litmus paper to help indicate that. And the other key one is about fermentation. Now, if we've got high levels of ammonia, and the sort of silage you really can't wash off your hands, you take with you to the pub, unfortunately, because everybody can smell your hands, um, then you are going to get limited intakes on, on that sort of silage. So the fermentation is, is, is a key factor in palatability and intake. So I would always cross-check those with the analysis to make sure it makes sense. And if you've got any concerns, then um, ask for a repeat analysis or send another sample in. Now, just on silage sampling, there is no point taking one handful of one big bale and expecting that to be a representative amount or a quality of the quality of your silages um, through the winter. So it is really important to take um, representative samples. So if I had a stack of big bales, I would expect um, you to take take five handfuls, um, five, five cores, should I say, sorry, five cores from five bales, seal them all up again and mix them up in one bag. Um, and, I, and that would be taken from each stack of bales, assuming they've been piled differently from different crops. Um, and likewise, I would want full deep cores through a, um, at least three cores through a, um, a clamp to make sure we've got as close to a representative sample as possible. <clears throat> So in terms of working out diets, we need to assess how much a ewe can eat of these forages. So um, what we generally do is try to predict ewe dry matter intake. And when a ewe is dry or post-weaning, early mid-pregnancy, her needs are only about 1.5% of her body weight. So for a 70 kilogram ewe, that would be equivalent to about just over a kilogram of dry matter. So if you were thinking about um, uh, that as grazed grass, you probably get a kilogram of dry matter would give you anywhere between 10 to 12 megajoules per day, depending on the time of year that um, the animal was grazing. And 10 megajoules is maintenance requirement for a ewe of 70 kilos. 
So in late pregnancy, the ewe needs to eat rather more to meet her increasing needs. And um, we generally ration to something like two to two and a half percent of body weight. Um, so for a 70 kilo ewe, that's anywhere between 1.4 to 1.7 kilograms of dry matter per day. And um, on the same basis as before, if we were looking at the energy requirements, we would need to be getting about 18 megajoules, 17 to 18 megajoules into a 70 kilogram ewe in late pregnancy just before lambing. Um, so for early lactation, who's got rid of all her um, load of, of fetuses, um, she's actually lactating and her appetite increases enormously. So she can now eat something like three and a half percent of her body weight, which is equivalent to more like two to two and a half kilograms of dry matter per day. So we're talking about much higher intake of nutrients um, in lactation. So um, one way of working out a forage um, might be to um, uh, use this table. This is a table that was prepared by uh, John Vipond and Colin Morgan, SAC, as a back of the envelope way of trying to um, give you a simple way of working out a diet. So as you can see, there are um, six forages listed and you will see the second column gives you the ME, the metabolizable energy in the dry matter of these forages. And you can see we've got the full range from straw at the bottom of the pile or top of the list here in um, the table at 6.5 megajoules per kilogram dry matter. And as you all know, there isn't much feed value in straw. Straw is good for keeping the rumen healthy. It's got lots of um, you know, sort of um, sharp, uh, spiky, you know, strong fiber, which actually stimulates the rumen wall and keeps the rumen functioning well. But the ewe can't eat a lot of it. And classically with straw, we'd probably offer um, a kilo and a half and the ewe would maybe eat um, half of that. So she's not going to eat a lot. So we actually say she'll eat about 1% of her body weight. So for a 70 kilo ewe, that would be about 0.7 of a kilo. So somewhere around that. So we're estimating that in the 12 to three weeks pre lambing And as you can see, this table estimates that intakes fall um, we're finding more and more that intakes are only really falling in the last week before lambing, um, just as the hormonal changes are happening to prepare for lambing. Um, and we're maybe not seeing the fall off that this table might suggest. But these are reasonable indicators, I think, for you to work through. Um, and I'll show you in a moment. But taking it moving on from straw at 6.45 ME, we then move up the scale to average hay, good hay, poor silage, good silage, and very good silage. And you can see the highest intake, dry matter intake, from any of these forage is, is going to be the good hay at 9.5 ma or the very good silage at 11.5. So we're getting 1.8% of body weight at that point because good hay really good hay they love it they can eat a lot of it there's no limitations on intake because um it's not got a low ph um it's not got any fermentation acids um it's not got any ammonia to um you know um uh, affect palatability so um use our um, on good hay can eat an awful lot of it um, likewise, on very good silage, a nice, dry, very well made, high energy silage, um, you can almost cope on that with no supplement whatsoever. Um, perhaps a little bit of extra protein, depending on what the analysis tells us. Um, and if you look at the poor silage and the good silage, you can see how they're affected and the sort of level. So a poor silage, not a good fermentation, perhaps 1.4% of body weight in those 12 to three weeks pre lambing dropping to 1.2 at three to naught weeks. And um, likewise, if you go to the good silage at 10.5 ME, 1.6% of body weight going to 1.4. So if you can bear those in mind when we move on to the next slide, or um, I'm going to use an example with the good silage line, um, hopefully fairly typical of some of the forages you actually are feeding yourselves at 10.5 ME. So this this um, slide just tells us about the energy requirements. These are in the Feeding the U booklet, um, but they are taken out of a, a book that was published in 1993 called the AFRC 1993 recommendations and um, everybody who's sort of involved in, in rationing would consider these to be good levels, good standards to work to in terms of nutrition and these being adequate um, levels for our sheep, the sheep of today. 
So just want to walk you through this calculation. So for a 70 kilogram ewe carrying twins, a good silage is 10.5 ME. And I said in that table before that we have an appetite of 1.6% of body weight. So 1.6% of 70 kilograms is 1.12 kilograms of dry matter. So um, the 1.12 kilograms has got 10.5 megajoules per kilogram. So we simply multiply the 1.12 by 10.5, and that would give us 11.8 megajoules. Now, the U, 70 kilogram U, only needs 11 megajoules um, in at seven weeks pre-lamming. So there would be no need whatsoever to supplement this U at seven weeks pre-lamming because she's meeting all her needs from the silage alone. If we do redo the calculation at five weeks, when the U actually needs about 13 megajoules, she's now a little bit short of energy. Um, so the U needs um, an extra, if we look at 13 minus 11.8, we need another 1.2 megajoules, which isn't very much, um, but just to work out what it might mean in terms of um, compound feed, the 10.75 figure in yellow is effectively a 12.5 ME cake as fed. Because um, every time you buy a compound or any feedstuff, you buy a bit of water. So to actually consider if we have a quote of 12.5 megajoules per kilogram dry matter for a compound and we convert it to as fed, that would be 10.75 based on um, the product having 14% water. So to achieve that little bit of extra energy, we would actually only need 0.11 of a kilogram of concentrates to supplement that U at five weeks pre-lamming. Now, the debate is whether 0.11 kilograms is worth feeding. And in my view, it's only a very small amount, and it would be very difficult to allocate that evenly across a group of ewes. Um, so I would make that decision on whether the ewes needed it in terms of body condition score. And my minimum level of feeding would be about 0.2 of a kilo in in order to allow everybody to try to get their fair share of concentrates, be them spread on the floor, uh, floor fed or um, in troughs. So that would be debatable according to um, body condition score. So if we do the calculation again, one week pre-lamming, when the full energy requirement would be 18 megajoules of energy for um, a 70 kilo U, um, we then find that she is short of uh, nearly eight um, megajoules of um, energy and to achieve that we'd need to put in about 0.7 of a kilogram of compound feed. So I hope that sort of looks reasonably uh, balanced for you. I often don't at ration to 18 megajoules myself. I often just put in 17, which would bring us down to about 0.6 of a kilo of compound pre-lamming, which if the user in good condition, that will be fine rationing to 17 megajoules. You have to remember that the more concentrates you put in, the less forage um, that you will eat because we're filling up her dry matter capacity by putting in lots of concentrates. So we want to optimize forage intake and um, give the appropriate and balanced supplement. And Leslie will be saying much more about that um, in the next webinar. <clears throat> <clears throat> So I just wanted to say, if, if you do that calculation, the one I've just walked you through, and if you do want to see how to do it and get more detail of that, I know it doesn't come over particularly well on a webinar, but um, the details and, and guidance on that are in, I think they're in the Improving U Nutrition booklet from AHDB and in the Feeding the U book. But if you looked at that and looked at two different forages, one at 10.5 ME and one at 9.5, you would actually see, I hope you see that on the scale here, um, that it's about a 10 kilogram difference for one megajoule of difference in silage quality. So it's 10 kilograms of compound feed difference for a better silage. So you'd be 10 kilograms less on the 10.5 ME silage as opposed to um, the 9.5 ME silage. So that really does point to making better silage and cutting that little bit earlier, um, potentially next year, if you haven't achieved high quality silage this year. So we could be talking if, you know, depending on what you're paying for your compound feeds, and I'm hearing figures of, you know, 260 pounds a tonne for the top end quality concentrates, you know, we could be talking about um, well over two pounds a U in saving by having that bit better quality forage. <clears throat> So thank you, everybody. I think I've um, run. I've done about 40 minutes, so I'm hoping that is um, uh, covered what I need to cover in this part of the um, webinar. But I'm really welcoming. I'll welcome any questions you've got at this point. 
thanks, Kate. Um, if everyone can uh, type in some questions that they've got, um, and I'll just remind you that the presentation has been recorded and will be available afterwards. You will get a, a link sent to your email afterwards if you did want to recap on anything um, that's been said this morning. And the Feed in the U manual and the other Feeding Better Returns manual are available on the website. Or if you'd like to receive a hard copy, then if you email BRP, then um, you'll be able to get that. Um, so the first question, Kate, that's come in, um, they've got a haylage devalue of 58 and a crude protein yep. of 12.3. Uh, the dry matter is uh, nearly 63. They are feeding a U-nut of 18% protein. The user in good body condition score of four. Do they need to also be giving them a high energy bucket or is that an added expense they don't need? Um, I would say they definitely didn't need to give the high energy bucket. Um, it very much depends though on the level of compound feed there that they're um, feeding to the ewes. But um, at body condition score four, there is no need to get them any fatter. Um, so we really need to look at, um, you know, how far they are out from lambing, the amount of compound feed they're feeding, um, and um, consider the cost. I mean, the high energy buckets are very expensive. They're probably at least double the cost of the compound feed. So um, given the good body condition of the ewes, there should be no need for that extra supplement, certainly not for twin bearing ewes and singles, definitely not. Okay, someone else has said, how about using licks instead of concentrates? And your thoughts on that? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, my, my, my concern is the cost. If you are in a position where labour is scarce and um, it's convenient for you to use licks and buckets and blocks and things, then that is fine. But I do do sort of caution how much they're costing you, particularly if they're um, high intake blocks. Um, you have to look and think, well, invariably they are more expensive so you might be talking double or even treble the price of a compound feed but if if you are short of labor then um you know that fits in for some systems of production and i think that answers another question that's come in and that they use a still out at grass but they said they're very um fat they're lamb in the beginning of march and um, they weren't intending to feed concentrates but just give them high energy buckets of 18 percent protein and thought that would be okay um, and I guess um, yeah. I think it would if they're lambing are they lambing outside um to decent amount of grass, um then the, the buckets will provide some trace elements, um potentially a little bit of protein and energy. Um but I, I just want to, you know, caution people in terms of how much they eating, look at the label on the bucket or block and see what the recommended intake is, um and consider how much is going because sometimes there are recommendations of point two of a kilogram a day, but use take point five. So you soon run away with a lot of money if they're taking double what you anticipate or what is recommended. <clears throat> okay. Um you mentioned about um how sharp um fibers are in the digestibility. Would you yep. want a sharper or a softer for good palatability? Uh, generally softer. Generally softer, Katie. Um, it's very easy to tell. If you've got two silages, I had two the other day, that one was a very sharp, mature um, silage, um, very sharp on the hands, really spiky to handle, and then the other one was very leafy. And if I had both of those silages on my farm, I would be getting them analysed and I would be um, using the spiky one a way out from lambing, I'd be saving the better, softer, more digestible one for close to lambing so that I'm minimizing the amount of concentrates I'm needing to buy in. So, yeah, very, very different. The softer one, much more digestible, um, much faster throughput through the rumen and the, you can eat more of it. Um, the spiky one is, is good for rumen health, but probably not very good nutritionally. So it's not providing an awful lot of energy and protein. Okay. Um, what about the scratch factor? Does that apply to sheep as well? Yeah, it does. If you think of many ewes that are actually um, housed, they are very regularly housed in straw, and they are more than delighted to be nibbling away at the straw as well as the forage they've been fed along the feed face or in ring feeders. Um, and they very often eat a fair amount of that and get quite a bit of sharp fibre from their bedding. So, yeah, um, it's always good to have some fibre in the diet, and that's the way we do it mostly with sheep, rather than forcing it into mixing it with, with um, 
in a mixer wagon or, or whatever system um, because they tend to pick it out and be- pick out the best things that they want to eat rather than eating it. But when they're given a nice fresh bale of straw, most of the farmers listening, I'm sure, would appreciate that they would all get their heads down into that and root around in it and eat some of that. Um, but they do tend to leave the really strong fiber, um, the really sharp stems on the floor, but they do pick off the leaves and more digestible bits of the um, of the straw and have some sharper, more mature fiber from that straw. Okay, um, a 70 kilo ewe with quads, what would be the M, um, ME requirement for that ewe in late pregnancy? Well, I would feed her as triplets, basically. Um, if, if, in many cases, a ewe having quads would end up with the same fetal load as a ewe having triplets so they'd just be four smaller lambs weighing about the same as the triplets would so i would um i would work to feeding her as a triplet and i can just look up i think it's going to be something about 20 20 megajoules or so for a triplet but i wouldn't overfeed a quad um, you might get the lambs um you know oversized difficult lambing and i would just think i'd treat, treat her as a as a triplet Okay. okay. Um, how easy is it, or uh, would you suggest TMR feeding for sheep, and do they need a mixer wagon to actually be able to do that? Um, sorry, what's the first part of the question, Katie? Um, let me just scroll back up because I've just had a load come in. Um, how easy is it to formulate um, a TMR ration for sheep, and if they did that, would they need a mixer wagon? Right. TMR rations are, yeah, um, quite you know easy to formulate you always assume they'll eat 10 percent more with a tmr because um you've got a nice even spread of ingredients and there's none of this shift in room and ph so you tend to get a better intake so you can usually get away with a little bit less supplementation and and a bit more forage in the diet um Ideally, yes, you would need some sort of mixer for the diet because that is key to getting this even intake of ingredients in every mouthful almost that the ewe is getting. It's very hard to do it with a shovel. It's very hard to do it um, with any other way. Um, But if you can devise one, um, great. But TMR does provide really good um, even intakes and um, a balanced diet throughout the day and is is second best to, to grazing really. Um, but I appreciate it does involve some expensive equipment. But um, some farmers I know have actually managed to get um, reconditioned um, feeder wagons relatively cheaply from the dairy industry um, and found that they have paid their way in um, a couple of years, really, depending on the size of your flock. Often only justifiable when you've got cattle to feed as well. Um, but if you've got a big flock, it, you know, highly justifiable, I would say. Um, but then you also have the downside of making sure you can feed it along a, a broad feed face so that um, uh, you know it's easily fed out so you may some farmers may find that they've got to redesign their buildings to accommodate um, a TMR style ration. Okay um, would molasses with protein be a good replacement instead of expensive feedlocks? Um, yeah um, you know there are a whole host of different molasses ba- molas- based um, licks um, on the market. Certainly um, on TMR diets, I find they're quite good to uh, supplement a low protein silage to get some room and degradable protein in there. Um, You've got to think what quality of protein you've got and the balance with the forage you're feeding. So um, if you had a low protein and a low digestibility forage, um, a room and degradable protein source within molasses would be quite a good fix because that would help the bugs to digest the um, forage better. Um, but if you were needing um, more energy, um, then I would probably go to, you know, you're needing a higher intake, I would probably go to a compound feed. But um, Bear in mind, a lot of liquid feeds can be quite expensive. You need to look at the pence per litre, pence per kilogram of dry matter to work out whether they're any more cost effective than um, a dry feed would be. So don't always assume it might look relatively cheap, but bear in mind, a lot of liquid feeds are only 60% dry matter or 70% dry matter. So it's important to do the calculation relative to a dry feed of equivalent nutrient value. Okay. Um, do dietary needs alter between commercial breeds and native breeds? 
Um, usually when I'm doing rations, um, we find that um, I normally base rations on the body weight of the ewe. So I look at an average body weight, say at, um, you know, sort of mid-pregnancy, um, when they haven't put loads of weight on in terms of uh, the pregnancy, but anywhere from topping to, to mid-pregnancy, that would be my average mature weight for a ewe. Um, and I would base it on that rather than on a breed basis. OK, so um, we have our requirements laid out based on live weight of the ewes. So it, anything from 40 kilogram Herdwicks maybe up to 90 kilogram Suffolk mules or, or bigger breeds. But I'm, I generally base the requirements on the body weight of the animal, not the breed. And obviously, okay. we would base, base the diet on litter size and body condition score too, because they're critical in terms of getting the right amount of energy um, and protein into our, our use. Okay, thank you. Um, is there a need to supplement use with twins in early lactation when uh, grass is plentiful? Um, uh, early lactation, um, it very much depends on the quantity of grass. So if you can get some sure of dry matter availability and sort of the covers available, and um, it's certainly very possible on good spring grass. Good spring grass can be 12 megajoules per kilogram dry matter and 20 odd percent protein. Um, so it really is, is, if there's enough of it, it can certainly meet the use needs without supplementation. The only thing is usually a surplus of in spring grass is room and degradable protein. So um, there may be, well, there is an energy cost for the ewe to get rid of some of that um, very digestible protein. Um, and sometimes a supplement like fodder beet would be a really good match with spring grass with high protein because it's providing some nice digestible fib um, fiber and digestible sugar. Um, and that is a good, good balance with high protein spring grass. So if there's masses of grass, there should be no need to supplement. But if there's a reasonable amount of um, high energy, high protein grass, something like sugar beet pulp or um, um, Fodder beet would be a good supplement to, to complement the forage. Okay, thank you. Um, looking, someone's looked at their silage analysis and trying to find the ammonia to check it's less than 10. Uh, does that okay. come under the word ash? They obviously can't find it on, on what that No, there, it should be ammonia N as percent uh, total N, something like that. Do you want me to flip back? I can flip back to the... Um, the analysis sheet I had, Katie. Um, and uh, where is it? Let me have a look. Is it on the, oh, no, I've taken it off. But it should be somewhere in the protein section. Or Oh, no, there it is, actually. I've just found it on this analysis. So if you look back to the presentation, there's an ammonia N figure on this. This is a, a company called Scientech that did this analysis, but obviously there's a whole host of laboratories out there that can do the analysis for you. But this one has got 7.6% ammonia. Can you see that on the screen? Yeah, can I see that, Katie? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So hopefully everyone else can. Um, do okay. you recommend three-in-one feeders? Um, three-in-one feeders um, potentially have um, our labour saving. Um, I think animals need to be trained to eat from them. Um, I mean, I try not to recommend anything in particular um, and favour any commercial products over others. Um, but I do know some farmers who are using those very good effect. Um, they basically allow a limited amount of concentrates in a day, and um, that's a theory, so that you lick out of the groove and are limited to, as the, the lowest limit would be 0.2 of a kilo, but then you can actually vary from 0.2 of a kilo up to a kilo. Um, so you've just got to make sure the user trained to eat from them. So that, that's a key thing before you um, rely on them in, in late pregnancy. So if you do find the shy feeders or some animals are protecting the feeder from others um, in a shed, then um, it can be problematic. But make sure they're all eating. And the company do um, offer some food dye to show which ones are eating, which stains their noses to tell you if they're eating um, so that is helpful, but keep an eye on body condition score and um, monitor the amount they're taking. Okay. Um, how many kilograms of fresh weight turnips should they be feeding a 70 kilo ewe for maintenance? Right. Turnips are, let's say they're about, if we said they're 11 ME, I need my calculator. 
Let's make your turnips. Um, all right, I just need to find a, a figure or two. Hope bear with me a minute. Um, well, if we said there about um, 10, 10% dry matter, um, so maintenance for you, right, 10, um, uh, about 10, um, about 10 kilos, because if you think that if they were about, if they were 10 ME, just looking for an ME content of turnips, I think they're more like about, about, about 11 and a half, actually. So 11.5, um, uh, so if we had... Um, so if I had 10 divided by 11.5 equals that. Uh, whoops, I can't see my calculator. Oops. Uh, um, 10, bear with me, everybody. Sorry about this. Oops, 0.86 divided by 0.1. Um, yeah, about eight, eight, 8 or so, 8 to 10 kilograms in a day of fresh, of fresh turnips. Okay, assuming they're about 10% dry matter. Okay. Okay. Good thank you. Um, is feeding hay better than silage for breeds in particular swales? Um, no, um, I would say not. Um, uh, hay is very palatable. Um, generally speaking, on average, I would say hay quality is poorer than silage because it's generally left longer in the field and um, cut at a later stage. So often the ME of hay would be on average lower than that of silage. Um, uh, swales are perfectly happy with big rail silage, haylage, um, not a problem. Uh, either forage is good. I, I don't have a preference really. Okay, um, I've got lots of questions coming, but I think we'll wrap it up with a few with the last couple now. Um, okay. Use at prolapse is that mainly due to them being too fat, or does it mainly happen to triplets or the lambs being too big? What would your um, assumption be on that? Yeah, my, my view on prolapse is a, a combination of things, really, Katie, and I think most farmers probably online would, would agree with me. Um, we don't know for absolute certain, but um, in my experience over many years now, I think it is largely to do with an internal body fat, a, a lot of impact of internal body fat, um, and the ewe stores fat inside her body as well as on her back, and condition scoring only tells us about what's on the back not what's inside them and quite often um when i've sort of thought about the bigger prolapse problems that farmers report to me um it does seem to be those ewes that get fat in mid-pregnancy um so maybe they've gone away to dairy keep um for um a few months and come back having eaten all this fantastic grass and come back over condition condition score four perhaps um, um but i also think there could be a link with um an imbalanced diet so if you can imagine you're feeding a forage but you're not giving the rumen the right amount of rumen available protein or fermentable energy for the bugs to really do a good job on that forage then i think there can be sort of the sort of hold up a sort of a, a bonging up of the rumen and potentially that um getting an imbalanced diet could add to the problem so i think fat is a fundamental one but i think getting the the diet balanced properly um probably will help too and I think it is it is more common in multiple births than it is obviously in um, singles. We hardly see prolapses in singles, but we do in twins, triplets, and quads. So um, it's more common in multiple births. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, this one is: uh, What's the best supplement to use on red silage, red clover silage in heavenly pregnant ewes, which is 19% protein and 11.2 ME? 71 dB. Well, well, you hardly need anything. <laughs> You'd probably manage without any supplementation. Um, there's masses of protein there um, and uh, energy um, and use. In my experience, they've done a couple of years of trials at Harper Adams recently, one funded by AHDB, where the use just absolutely adore the red, red clover and we only fed, and it wasn't as good as the sample you're mentioning, it wasn't as high energy as yours, and we literally only gave a small amount of uh, beet pulp and barley in the last three weeks before lambing. So um, really, that sounds such a wonderful silage. You, the, the, main, the main issue is going to stop them eating too much of it because um, they could get fat on that silage. It sounds a brilliant silage. So very, you know, hardly any supplementation, perhaps some minerals that, that you would need to supplement that. 
Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Kate. And apologies, we haven't answered everyone's questions. We have had an uh, extremely large amount of questions come in this evening, um, but I hope you've all found that really useful. It's been a great turnout, um, and I'd like to thank Kate, obviously, for your expertise this evening. Just a reminder, okay. if you haven't already registered for part two on the 25th of February, then please do so. Um, and also, if you've got any of the issues that I mentioned at the start on the troubleshooting and practical feeding issues, send those in to brp at ahdb.org.uk and we'll, we'll obviously sift through those and get the main topics which Leslie will focus on as part of that webinar to hopefully um, give you all some more food for thought at this key time of year of feeding the ewe. So thank you very Katie, much. You said, you all Katie, you said, evening. sorry, Katie, you said February. It's January, isn't it? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. January. Sorry, it's, it's January. January. Yeah, yes. okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. You are. Um, you are. Yes. We'll see you all next okay. Thursday um, on the 25th. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.